All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, how's everybody doing today? Welcome. All right, good. Welcome to our uh, Army Cyber Hot Topic. Thank you for being here. And of course, a very happy birthday to the US Army. What a great Army day. We'll talk about what we're doing uh, just in a little bit. Uh, my name is Alex Brody. I'm the Director of Meetings at AUSA. And before I introduce our host, uh, General Brown, our President and CEO, I'd like to make just a few administrative announcements. Uh, your badge that you have on right now is required throughout this event. Please make sure you wear it at all times. If you lose it, please just stop by the registration area, ask our team, we'll get you a replacement, no issue. Any proceedings and handouts at this event will be available on our website uh, after the event within about 24 hours. So just go to ausa.org backslash meet and uh, you'll be able to find any proceedings and handouts from this event today. Our latest land power essay, Move, Strike, Protect, is now available online. When you get a chance, please go online to ausa.org backslash studies and check out our great new publication. Questions. As with all of our events, I have question cards. I'll walk up and down the aisle and hand them out and ask that you write your questions down. I'll then take them up to the moderator, hand them off, and they will get to your questions with the time that we have. Um, for any keynote speakers, I will walk the room with a mic. So please start thinking about your questions in advance. I'll hand you the mic and we'll get to your questions with the time that we have. Press. We have press at our events. We have press here today. So we are on record and for attribution. Membership. Who here is a member of AUSA? Please raise your hand. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, that was actually a trick question, though, because... If you weren't a member when you registered, you became one when you registered. You are now a basic member. So congratulations. Everybody in the room is a member of AUSA. We are a membership organization, and honestly, we, we can't do what we do without you. So thank you for your support. When you get a chance, please stop by the registration desk. Ask for uh, Trip Wickard, who is out there. He can answer any questions you might have and review all the great benefits of being a member of AUSA. We also have an AUSA store out in the lobby. Uh, we have a number of great items on sale, including this epic army man. <laughs> it's a great gift for the army birthday today. So make sure you go out, talk to Desi, pick up a great gift, including the army epic man, and bring that home to your uh, family or children. As I mentioned, we are uh, celebrating the army birthday today. So we will have a recognition at 1130. We will do a cake cutting. Uh, in our honor of the Army's 248th birthday. So uh, stick around for that at 1130. After that, we'll have a networking lunch. Um, so we hope that you'll stick around, network with everybody here. It's a great chance to catch up and uh, connect during the event. Wireless internet is available. We use AUSA gift, guest and Blackjack 76 with the exclamation point at the end. Cell phones, please make sure they're off. Or anything that makes noise, um, please have it silenced. And last but certainly not least, I want to thank our sponsors today. We have two. Uh, our first is a four-star sponsor, SOSI, and our second is a two-star sponsor, Raytheon. Uh, we can't thank our national partners enough for their support of AUSA, specifically our events like this hot topic. So let's give our two sponsors a big round of applause. If you're interested in being a sponsor in the future, please connect with Emily Call. She is our sponsorship manager. She's here throughout the event. Uh, she's in the lobby. Please uh, connect with her during the break, and she'll be happy to talk about all the great benefits of being a sponsor of AUSA. All right, and with that, my five minutes of fame are up. It's my pleasure to introduce the president and chief executive officer of the Association of the United States Army. Please give General Robert Brown a warm welcome. All right, boy, it's great to be here. Uh, it's been too long for cyber since 2019 with COVID, and then we had a little break. So uh, we're very excited to be here today, especially, as was mentioned, 248th birthday of the United States Army. We will, you know, eat, eat uh, the breakfast that's provided, but don't stuff yourself because we're going we're gonna to start at lunch with uh, Army birthday cake, right? And uh, everybody's authorized 
you know, we don't want to have some eat it, some don't, and then people feel guilty. Everybody's got to have a piece of cake, and then nobody feels guilty. We're good to go. Well, what a uh, a great opportunity. You know, I was thinking in that 248th birthday, the majority of that cyber was not even around, right? And uh, I never had to worry about cyber when I was young. And it's clearly the domain uh, with the greatest potential, uh, also with the greatest challenges. Uh, and we're going to look at a lot of that today. The theme of building the Army of 2030 and maturing the cyber domain. Uh, really, uh, again, uh, just uh, perfect timing with everything that's going on in cyber. And in in uh, the audience, we have a real great mix of uh, folks from academia, military, uh, a lot of our allies and partners, uh, industry, of course. And so I would just encourage you, as Alex said, uh, ask questions of the panel. This is a great opportunity to ask all kinds of questions, really dig into a lot of the areas uh, and make sure, you know, the discussions uh, normally uh, when we get audience participation like that, we get incredible discussions. And that's really what we need in this topic, for sure. Uh, no doubt about it. You know, Cyber Command has five, Army Cyber Command has five operational uh, capabilities, operate, defend, attack, influence, uh, and inform. Uh, each one of those is complex, uh, but we're going to dig into a lot of that today. And then two core capacities, people and platforms. And we all know how critical people, people are, you know, again, the old uh, uh, general uh, retired Creighton Abrams, people aren't in the army, people are the army. And I would say the exact same for cyber, the quality and the people are absolutely key. So we'll look at some uh, good questions today, we'll really explore, obviously to defend, how do you defend the networks to improve national security? Defense is so key, uh, absolutely critical. We'll take a look at, uh, you know, how do we uh, upskill some individuals we have and reskill others uh, in the current workforce to compete for talent? And then how do you, you know, retain that talent uh, that's in demand? Uh, and and I will tell you, you know, out there seeing uh, the incredibly talented cyber warriors, uh, uh, you know, it's just inspirational when you see them. And I would often ask them, I got, you know, you could be doing this making 10 times as much. But uh, every answer was always that they were they, they really enjoyed their job because they were so empowered by their chain of command. They were doing what they loved and they knew they were making a difference. Uh, but the reality is they're not going to do it forever. So how do we retain them? How do we keep that motivation, keep those skills and the, the talented workforce? And then, you know, AI. Holy smokes. Uh, you can hardly, uh, you know, look at any article today. It doesn't talk about AI and everybody's going to leverage AI, uh, AI this, AI that. Uh, and it is key. I think as you look at, uh, you know, clearly the future is multi-domain operations, all domain operations, whichever you want to call it. But it's clearly the future and you can't do it. You can't have the speed of decisions without leveraging AI. And so how do we get after leveraging that AI, uh, take advantage of it all, make sense of it all? Uh, because uh, we all know, you know, AI is wonderful, but garbage in I mean, it can be garbage out How, who's who's writing that algorithm what is it telling you uh and uh leveraging ai will be key we're also going to take a look uh, in the panels what's going on in ukraine you know the uh, uh as we see daily the lessons coming from there and that uh, terrible conflict and uh, russia's uh, you know, brutal uh, invasion but as we look uh you know so many lessons being learned as you see and and many of them in fact i would almost say most of them are in cyber and you know this area in cyber and uh, so that'll be a key topic today as well you got over uh, 20 speakers again from experts within the army outside the army and academia and industry uh and and across the cyber community so very excited about that and and again, challenge them with your questions, and let's make sure it's a it's a it's a rich discussion. Most of these folks are experts in their field, and uh, so we're really uh, really looking forward to it. Now, I want to thank uh, Lieutenant General Maria Barrett and and the amazing team at Army Cyber Command. We wouldn't we wouldn't be saying we haven't had one of these since 2019. We wouldn't be having one without her team's effort. They really work this hard to make sure the topics are spot on. The discussions will be great. So, Maria, thanks thanks so much to you and your team. This did a fantastic job, uh, and we're really looking forward to it. Um, so let's start. Let's kick it off uh, with, I would say, an officer that, you know, when you look, you read 
uh, Maria Barrett's resume, if you will, and it is the perfect positioning for this critical command at this critical time. What an amazing leader. She was commissioned in ROTC in 1988 at Tufts University, got a bachelor's degree in international relations, got a couple masters, uh, national resource strategy from the Industrial College of the Armed Forces, the Eisenhower School, and telecommunications management from Webster University. But when you look at previous assignments from commanding NETCOM to all her uh, her early assignments in, in Signal, and then recently, really the last four, uh, Deputy Commander of Operations for Cyber National Mission Force, Deputy Commanding General Joint Force Headquarters, uh, Cyber and our Cyber, uh, Deputy Director of Current Operations, J3, United States Cyber Command. I mean, you know, talk about perfect positioning uh, in this critical area and uh, the right commander at the right time. So without further ado, Maria, we welcome you and uh, look forward uh, to hearing from you this morning. Let's have a warm welcome for Lieutenant General Maria Barrett. Thanks, General Brown. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, everything that AUSA and the sponsors have done to host this event um, in a while. Uh, I am really looking forward to today. Um, I also want to give a special thanks, shout out for uh, Pat Scanlon. Uh, I think that guy has a PhD in multitasking. <laughs> I was in the green room at Landpack watching him work the hot, our hot topic event while there was a myriad of other things. If you went to Landpack, then you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so just an amazing job helping us orchestrate this and make this a, a really first class event today. Um, I also wanna thank everybody here in the room. And, and the reason why is because we, we have assembled as General Brown outlined a, a really great number of panels and panelists and moderators uh, with a very specific purpose in mind. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but also for the folks who are in the room, from the media, from US government, from academia, from industry, right? I, I guarantee you today's measure of a success is the dialogue. Right? We've done our part with assembling some really phenomenal people from across uh, the spectrum uh, that deal with or touch upon cyber. Uh, but your questions, I am gonna take just as much today away from where you are digging into as what's going to be presented here. And so I'm gonna thank you in advance. So what are we doing here? We're building the Army of 2030 and maturing this domain. And, and if I think back to a year ago, just over a year ago, when I took over from the helm from Steve Fogarty, and I considered what the evolution of um, cyber in the Army or Army cyber uh, has been. We have gone from an organization when it was birthed to focusing simply on cyberspace operations, offensive and defensive, and really now matured that across the entire information dimension. So what am I talking about here? It's operating the networks. It is the offensive and defensive cyberspace operations. It's also information operations. It is also electromagnetic warfare. And we found that there is a great synergy between these things from how we do intelligence, from the censoring part of the battlefield to the fact that if you are going to take a look at information operations and, and foreign malign influence and how that gets conducted, at its very essence, it's ones and zeros. It's a network, it's platforms, that are spreading and you need to understand that network, not just the content. And so these things all come together. And now how do we take this, all of this, which is in the information dimension to provide information advantage? How do we use this to enable decision dominance? In an environment that is uh, where we are, we talk about competition, right? That competition space in cyber is 24-7, 365. 
And I would probably say that the competition space in the information dimension, the form line influence piece is very real and constant. And we need to think about these things across the continuum of conflict, competition, crisis, and conflict. It is important for us to not only think about these things, and when I talk today, I am not talking just for Army Cyber and its organizations, subordinate organizations. I would also say we need to take into context the other aspects of Army echelons that are looking at these things. Multi-domain task forces, the triad, the IEW formations, the General Flynn's Information Advantage Task Force. All of these capabilities come together to not only take a look at how we combat some of the real challenges that um, our competitors are throwing at us, um, but also to enable that decision-making and those opportunities for the Joint Force Commander. There's this other piece that where we're moving to as an army, and what does data-centric operations look like? And across all of these areas that we're performing in, offensive, defensive, information operations, there's a core, it just running our networks, there's a core aspect of this which is data-centric operations. Over and over and over again, as we at Army Cyber are met with particular challenges, regardless of what the, the mission is that we're doing, there's a core component of this which comes down to data, moving data, understanding data, analyzing data. And the complexity is such that when we start thinking about the Army of 2030, how is it that we drive down that complexity? I think about these things through the lens of set the theater, building capability and capacity, operationalizing those capabilities, and delivering combat capabilities. So this is a little bit of how, when the team and I sat down and said, what, what should we focus on for these panels? And we couldn't focus on everything. I, I'm going to tell you, there were some things that were left on the cutting room floor that made me cry. And feel free, if we don't touch on your particular uh, topic today of interest, and it's relative to cyber, please don't hesitate to ask us the question. Any one of these panels, or I'll open it up to questions afterwards, um, we should be able to squeeze something in. I've had the good fortune over the last year with my team to go out and visit research centers, industry, labs, and a host of other locations so that we can stay sharp and really understand how, how people are thinking about this space. What you're gonna see here today is um, reflective of our journey. As we've come out of some of those sessions and we do our after action review, hey, that was pretty interesting. We want to follow up on that. But there was also this conversation of, wow, that person would be really awesome to be on a hot topic panel with us. And so we have pulled in some people today that may not have ordinarily um, come to an Army event, and I think that's extra special as well. So if I haven't conveyed to you that I'm super excited about what we're going to be talking about today, um, here we go. Now, Joan Brown kind of stole a little bit of my thunder with talking about the panels, but let me put them in the context through the lens that I just gave you. Set the theater. We've been thinking about what does it mean for Army Cyber to set the theater when we have a global mission 24-7, 365. There is a theater aspect of this, but it is also across the adversary knows no boundaries. Um, and presents challenges to us across the globe. 
But to scope that down, where we went was, let's start at home. Let's, what does it mean to defend the nation? What does it mean to start taking a look at some of the things that our forces really need to move from fort to port to mobilize? And now we're starting to talk about sustainment and critical infrastructure. And if you're talking about sustainment and critical infrastructure, well, you're talking about operational technology and platforms and we're blessed to have the principal cyber advisor for the Army moderating that panel on operational technology and critical infrastructure. This is something that has been called out in the NDEA as a go-do. Right? It's been highlighted in the National Defense Strategy. Uh, and down through, uh, it pleases me to walk into a Forcecom mobilization tabletop exercise and hear every single one of the commander's briefing talking about critical infrastructure, not just on our installations, but inside the, outside their fence line in the community. And they are thinking through that challenge because it is a real challenge. Contestation is not just going to be within the theater of operations. It will be in the homeland and we need to prepare for that. So, this panel really needs to, uh, they're going to get after not just thinking about operational technology and modernization. This is not just a material discussion. This has to extend across .lpf if we're going to be effective at it. When I start thinking about capability and capacity, that capacity thing ends up being the people. And, and as I tell people about how we think about talent management in Army Cyber, um, there is no single silver bullet for how you do talent management. It is a cradle to grave endeavor. How are you bringing them in? How are you identifying them? Military and civilian. The civilians on some of our Cyber Mission Force teams are some of the most valuable and experienced people that we have on our teams bar none. And experience matters in this domain. Let me say that again. Experience matters in this domain. Everything we do must be building that experience and then surrounding that experience with the critical enablers that they need to do their job. I say that what we do here, it takes a village. It really does. It, it is the data scientists and the data managers and engineers who run our big data platform that enable those experienced cyber operators, the ones that defend the weapons platform that they conduct their offensive operations from. It is our strategists. It, it is our targeteers. Oh my goodness, if you meet a warrant officer, a targeting warrant officer in one of our cyber mission force teams, he's gonna tell, he or she is gonna tell you that the, the number of packages that they put forward far exceeds whatever they would do in a core division because we're operating every single day. Those guys are exercised. Now, we've been accused of exercising them so much that maybe the Fire Center of Excellence doesn't want to give us any more because we, we hold on to them and they're having a great time doing their job. But this is part of the village. Those enablers are absolutely critical. And as we look on the horizon to the emerging technologies um, that are coming down the pipe, we could continually have to assess what our skills, what does our skilled workforce look like and adapt that. So the talent management side of the house is very real about how to identify people with the aptitude and the desire to serve because that race for talent is very real. We're not gonna compete dollar for dollar, right? So how do we tap into that 
and retain our very best. I mentioned AI. Now, everybody's going to think about that as a machine, but Al will tell you that, guess what? Everybody who's played around with chat GPT, yeah, it's people feeding that machine. It is. So that's my segue. That's the, that was the best segue I could get from people to AI. Um, this area absolutely has, as Joan Brown astutely put it, the highest potential um, to really, really drive change, to help us reduce that complexity, make, the, make routine tasks, incorporate that, and leverage that. Um, but it also presents for us very, very real challenges as well across the information dimension. Um, some of the things that we have been doing, we've really made a, a, continue to make actually, I would say, a significant investment in our big data platform. And I mentioned data earlier. You do not get to AI and machine learning without having that repository of data. And, and significant increases in what we've been able to do in terms of we have doubled the amount of data flows going into our platform, doubled the parsers, doubled the storage of what we're storing right now, and we're continuing on in that trajectory. And all of that means is we're at a point we are, where we are definitely postured to start taking, taking advantage of the capabilities that Mr. Mollenkopf and the panel members are going to be able to talk about today. We've been le leveraging this within Army Cyber, um, mostly in the defense of our networks, but also in the information dimension. What does it mean to bring in all sorts of different feeds, right? And really understand that information baseline of a particular environment so now you can understand when it changes and how it is changing and where it is changing. All of this is, is tremendously helpful to us. And I only see this uh, expanding. The fourth panel will really get into, if I think about that last piece of operationalizing capabilities, is Ukraine. Number one question when I go out and, and speak publicly or speak to anything from a captain's career course to an army general officer training session, what are we taking away from Ukraine? I actually have the, um, uh, many of the, the general officer training sessions uh, as you know, sir, you know, I get the opportunity to actually discuss this at a classified level hugely informative to our leaders. And I love that they're, the questions that they are asking, where they are in the headspace. And yes, what we, what we are witnessing in Ukraine is very much a land battle. It is holding terrain. It's exchanging terrain. But I don't think we can divorce the information dimension, what is going on in the information dimension from this conversation. Well, at the essence, it is a land battle. We can't dismiss the contestation in the environment from the electromagnetic spectrum to attacks on critical infrastructure to why did the Russian narrative not stick in Ukraine? There are things to take away in there. If you think about our competitors' intent to challenge us cognitively. We should not only be prepared to counter that, that's the automatic thing that we think of. How do we make ourselves resilient to it? How do we make soldiers and families resilient to a narrative that might uh, compromise their will to fight. 
We need to start thinking about this. And it all comes together. So with Ukraine, everybody is watching. We're watching. Our competitors are watching. And the adaptation that will occur, we need to anticipate. All right. I'm excited. I hope you guys are. Um, this is going to be a fantastic day. And again, thank you, sir, for hosting us. I'm ready for the panels. Thank you.